السلام عليكم ورحمة الله الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن لا إله إلا أشهد أن محمد رسول الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله حي على الصلاة حي على الفلا بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الحمد لله وكفى وسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى خصوصا على سيد الرسل وخاتم الأنبياء وعلى آله الأسكياء وأصحابه الأتقياء أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات أولئك هم خير البرية صدق الله العظيم. Of the greatest blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us iman. The ability to believe in Him, to know Him. This is such a deep blessing that if a person were to spend their entire life thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for this one point, they could not fulfill its right. Because for every other blessing, the payout occurs in this world. For wealth, for health, a person enjoys and takes the, reaps the benefits of it while they're alive. For iman, not only do you reap the benefit of it in this world, but the benefit of it lies eternally in the hereafter. That a person, no matter how bad they were, no matter how much wrong they did, they will be given Jannah. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, مَنْ قَالَ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ دَخَلَ الْجَنَّةِ Whoever said لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ will enter into paradise. In one narration, when the Sahabi heard this, he said, O Messenger of Allah, وَإِنْ زَنَا وَإِنْ سَرَقْ Abu Dhar al-Ghifari radiallahu anhu. 
That even if he committed a crime, even if he did wrong, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, wa in zana wa in sarat. So he said, the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, yes, even if he's done wrong, he will still go to paradise. The person asked a second time, wa in zana wa in sarak, and then a third time, wa in zana wa in sarak. And finally at the end, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, wa in zana wa in sarak ala raghmi an fi abi dhar. That yes, that person will go to paradise. Because of the power, the might of la ilaha illallah. Now there are multiple ways of looking at this narration. Some people they look at this narration of the Prophet of Allah and assume that by saying la ilaha illallah, now you are no longer accountable for all the wrong you do because the Prophet of Allah said, you will go to paradise. So go away and disobey, go and disobey Allah as much as you want. But this is a wrong understanding. How we know this is a wrong understanding is because the companions who heard this hadith from the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did not live by that understanding. That all we have the hadith Abu Dhar, Abu Dhar Ghifar radiallahu an, or in the other narration, Abu Huraira radiallahu an, or in the third narration, Mu'ad ibn Jabal radiallahu an, who all heard similar statements from the Prophet of Allah, their understanding was that man qala la ilaha illallah, and whoever, whoever, sa- whoever says la ilaha illallah, and then wa'amila bi muqtadahu, and then acts upon what that statement mandates and necessitates. If a person says, La ilaha illallah, there is no God but Allah, is that just a statement or does it necessitate something? Is there a truth and reality behind it? If I say this phone is free, is that just a statement or is there a truth behind it? That, tr- that truth now means, the truth behind that statement is, you now have a right to come and claim this phone. Because it's free. I no longer have the right to charge for it. Because it's free. When a person says, La ilaha illallah, when they make the statement of uluhiya, of ubudiyya, of rububiyya, that they're saying that my Allah is Allah. فَعَلَمْ أَنَّهُ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا هُ There is no God but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What does that necessitate? What that necessitates is tawakkul. What that necessitates is taslim. What, what it necessitates is that you submit yourself to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that you rely on Him. What it requires of you is that you don't complain to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you are content with what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has decreed for you. What that requires is that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls you to something, you come to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you are present. La yus'al amma yaf'al wa hum yus'alun. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not asked. No one has the right to ask anything from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wa hum yus'alun. However, they will be questioned by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is what iman is. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ أُولَٰئِكَ هُمْ خَيْرُ الْبَرِيَّةِ The reason why I started with this ayah is because it's so simple. It's so brief. Yet the message is as clear. إِنَّ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ أُولَٰئِكَ هُمْ خَيْرُ الْبَرِيَّةِ Those who believe and do good deeds, they are the best of creation. So it starts with iman. That you believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Belief is interesting because I think the easier part is to say La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. The harder part is to be loyal to that belief and to be committed to it in your heart. Specifically when you are tested by Allah Azawajal. When you're going through difficulty in your life. When the finances aren't adding up. When people in your family are giving you a hard time. When your health isn't keeping up to where you want it to be. All these thoughts and whispers of shaitan begin to you know, make their way into our minds and in our hearts. That, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He's abandoned you, and does God even exist? And all these things, they start coming into our heart, one by one, all these wasawis of shaitan. And the value of a person's iman is seen at the time of difficulty. That's when a person's iman is seen. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when describing Ashabul Badr, the companions who fought in, fought in the battle of Badr, while describing them, the language Allah Azza wa Jal uses in Surah Al-Anfal is phenomenal. Because these are people that are 313 standing in front of 1,000 strong, armed right to their teeth. And they are clearly in the disadvantaged position. These are people who history may know as the people who got battered. They're about to be those people, possibly, because the, the odds are against them. Yet when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes these 313 that are lined up, in the presence of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ الَّذِينَ إِذَا ذُكِرَ اللَّهُ وَجِلَتْ قُلُوبُهُمْ 
These were people that were tested. They were probably scared. They were worried, concerned. Their hearts were overwhelmed. But in that state, when Allah describes him, إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ الَّذِينَ إِذَا ذُكِرَ اللَّهِ وَجِلَتْ قُلُوبُهُمْ وَإِذَا تُلِيَتْ عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتُهُ زَادَتْهُمْ إِيمَانًا وَعَلَىٰ رَبِّهِمْ يَتَوَكَّلُونَ الَّذِينَ يُقِيمُونَ الصَّلَاةَ وَمِمَّا رَزَقْنَاهُمْ يُنْفِقُونَ أُولَئِكَ هُمُ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ حَقَّا لَهُمْ دَرَجَاتٌ عِنْدَ رَبِّهِمْ وَمَغْفِرَةٌ وَرِزْقٌ كَرِيمٌ Five traits Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes them by. This is in Surah Al-Anfal, which was revealed regarding the spoils of war that were acquired from the Battle of Badr. إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ الَّذِينَ إِذَا ذُكِرَ اللَّهُ وَجِلَتْ قُلُوبُهُمْ These are people that when the, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioned by them, their hearts begin to tremble and shake. They have reverence and respect for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How can a person play and joke and be disrespectful when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is being spoken of? The Allah that created us, the one that gave us a soul, the one that gave us iman, the ability to think and understand, I'm disrespectful in His presence, that I'm, you know, lahiyatun khulubuhum, my heart is distracted and turning away while the adhan is being called, that it's time for salah and I'm sleeping my way through it. إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ الَّذِينَ إِذَا ذُكِرَ اللَّهُ وَجِلَتْ قُلُوبُهُمْ This was a state of their iman. They were so in tune with their love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that the moment someone said Allah, what that name represented, what that being means to them, completely manifested. And as a result, there was a physical uh, uh, appearance of that and they would tremble, their hearts would shake and tremble. وَإِذَا تُلِيَتْ عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتُهُ زَادَتْهُمْ إِيمَانًا and when the verses of the Qur'an are recited upon them, their iman increases. As you're reading the Qur'an, your iman increases. There should be an honor every time you read an ayah of the Qur'an. And that honor is that Allah preserved these words for 1400 years for you and I to have the honor to read those exact same words. People of other generations, other nations that don't have their revelation, they would die to read the exact words of their God to read the exact words of their prophet, of their politician, or have the exact same statement of their favorite player, but there's some vague statement that maybe this is something similar to what they said. Here we have the exact words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. نَزَلَ بِهِ الرُّوحُ الْأَمِينَ عَلَىٰ قَلْبِكَ لِتَكُونَ مِنَ الْمُنْذِرِينَ بِلِسَانِ الْعَرَبِيِّ مُبِينَ That every part of it was preserved so mankind can benefit from this revelation. وَإِذَا تُلِيَتْ عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتُهُ زَادَتْهُمْ إِيمَانًا وَعَلَىٰ رَبِّهِمْ يَتَوَكَّلُونَ These are people that didn't flake. They didn't listen to those whispers of shaitan. That every time shaitan comes to you with those whispers that your Lord has abandoned you or that you're about to fail or you suck or you're miserable, when those thoughts begin to come in, I want you to see if you can teleport yourself back to the day Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was leaving Taif. The riwayah is mentioned. You can find it in multiple collections of hadith. That Rasulullah sat outside Taif, he was soaking in tears and crying after such a big letdown. Because in life, sometimes you put everything into something. And you give it your best. And no matter how much you try for something to happen, the opposite happens. How do you think Nuh felt when his son died on kufr? You think that was easy for him? Today, we as parents couldn't handle it. How would a prophet of Allah handle that? He was so hurt by this. He was so saddened by this. That he spoke to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shares that speech that Nuh salam had with his Lord in the Quran in Surah Hud. That how Nuh salam spoke to Allah. You know, he said, uh, These are a separate set of verses that should be examined one day, but not today. He was in pain. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clarifies, إِنَّهُ لَيْسَ مِنْ أَهْلِكَ إِنَّهُ عَمَلٌ غَيْرُ صَالِحٍ فَلَا تَسْأَلْنِ مَا لَيْسَ لَكَ مِنْ عِذْنٍ إِنِّي أَعِذُكَ أَن تَكُونَ مِنَ الْجَاهِلِينَ A very firm response from Allah subhanahu That you said that your son is from your family, his deeds were not good, he was not from your family. In order for a person to be worthy of a prophet, their deeds must be in line with that prophet. A person can say, I'm from the ummah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But the question is, are you? But I'm from his ummah. Are you? I have the blood of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in my veins. I'm from the Sadat, from the Sharif family. But are you? Because you're not acting like a Sharif right now. You're not acting like a Sayyid. In our deen, we are told 
ان الله لا ينظر الى صوركم واموالكم ولكن ينظر الى قلوبكم واعمالكم that your deeds are what matter not your not your nasab or hasab your lineage what matters are your deeds so then allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says فَلَا تَسْأَلْنِ مَا لَيْسَ لَكَ بِهِ عِلْمٍ So don't ask Allah regarding that which you have no knowledge. Why something happened is something you will never have the knowledge of and that's a question we are never allowed to ask. That's a summary of Nuh alayhi salam's story. فَلَا تَسْأَلْنِ مَا لَيْسَ لَكَ بِهِ عِلْمٍ Why? Why something happened? You can't ask Allah azza wa jal that. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows why did this difficulty occur in my life? Why did this challenge come to me? Why did things not work out the way I wanted them to work out? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows. And that's a part of us believing in Allah azza wa jal. For a person who doesn't believe in Allah, they don't believe in the compassion and knowledge of in Allah. So therefore, it's easy for them to disregard any existence of God. But for people who believe in Allah azza wa jal, we know that He is alim. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is all-knowing. Al-Basir, al-Sami'a. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is al-Rahman, al-Rahim, al-Ra'uf, al-Ghafoor. All of these names and attributes of Allah tell us who our Lord is. So when something doesn't happen, in the way that we want it to. The only true understanding and explanation is that this is out of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy. So now go back to Ta'if. When Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is sitting outside of that city after really wanting this to happen. He really wanted this to happen. And not only did it not happen, but they flipped the board on Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. A man who went to them hoping they'd become Muslim is now sitting there soaked in his own blood. The whole story flipped. And so now Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam raises his hands to make dua to Allah. And this dua of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam teaches us tawakkul. It teaches us ubudiyah. It teaches us ridha bil qada. This one dua of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is a moment that history should always cast its spotlight on. That never forget this moment in history. Where the man was broken and covered in tears and sweat and blood. Lonely. His family members had just passed away. Abu Talib and Khadija radiallahu anha. And after they had left him, he was so lonely in that moment. So vulnerable as a human being. But when the world comes crashing down, his dua is, Allahumma ashku ilayka dhu'fa quwwati wa qillata hilati. He's not complaining against Allah, he's complaining to Allah of his weakness. That maybe the reason why I am where I am right now is due to my lack of tact. Wa hawani ala al-nas, ya rabba al-musadha'afeen, ya arham al-rahimeen, ila man takilni, ila aduwin yatajahamuni, am ila da'ifin malaktahu amri, Ya Allah, who are you sending me over to? The wolves, they want to eat me. Ya Allah, I'm struggling, I'm weak in this moment. But that next statement that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam makes, he says, oh Allah, as long as you are not angry at me for this outcome, as long as you are not upset with this outcome, then I don't care what the outcome is. I don't care if I'm poor, rich, healthy, weak, strong, alone, with people, as long as you're with me, regardless of what the outcome is, I am happy. Because that's what matters. We don't control outcomes in our life. We control what we do in any given day. How this day ends, we don't know. You have the choice to be here. You came for Jum'ah Salah. You control that moment. Whether you walk away with something or not, is something you choose. How this day ends, that we don't know. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one that controls our taqdeer. So the Muslim doesn't obsess with how things end. The Muslim is very much focused on the present, on what I can do and control in this moment. A companion asked Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam this very intricate question. He said, O Messenger of Allah, if everything is um, already determined by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then what's the point in doing good deeds? So Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, اعملوا فكل ميسر لما خلق له اعملوا فكل ميسر لما خلق له when he proposed this statement that what's the point doing good deeds Allah has already written everything the first before actually Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam even said that he became angry first first Rasulullah became upset and he went quiet and was not happy with this person's chain of thinking because this is a shaitani way 
that it's all done, what's the point doing anything right now? If that's what society will become, we'll have a large army of human beings that are useless. We want people to work to their potential to do the best they can. Use their strength, use their intellect, use the faculties that Allah subhanahu has given us and push yourself to success. So Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, then when he spoke, he said, I'malu, your focus needs to be on your deeds. فَكُلٌ مُيَسَّرٌ لِمَا خُلِقَ لَهُ Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made it easy for a person to accomplish what they were created for. Your job is to go and do your good deeds. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's statement at that point in Taif is a lesson for us. That you don't give up. You never give up. What you must remember every day is your statement, La ilaha illallah. When your heart hurts in life, and you feel loneliness, in order to find that sabr, I want you to first and foremost peek into your iman. That you know that day that I said, La ilaha illallah, let me go back to that day. Every time shaitan comes and whispers in your heart, anything against your Allah, I want you to go back to that day of iman. That's the day that you said, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. And ask yourself, well, that day when I said, Ashadu an la ilaha illallah, when I've said, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, what does that statement actually mean to me? Iman cannot just be this theology that exists somewhere in some corner of our heart or locked away in some cupboard. Your iman needs to be a part of your life every day. That statement, La ilaha illallah, needs to be uttered by your tongue a hundred times every day. Every time shaitan comes with a wasbasa, I want you to repeat it again. La ilaha illallah. When you're feeling laziness in salah, la ilaha illallah. When you're having doubts whether you should give sadaqah or not, la ilaha illallah. When you're not sure whether you should be oppressive to your spouse or not, remember, la ilaha illallah. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave me a command, I will return back to him, I will be held accountable by him. That statement, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, is the one statement that will get the Muslim through this world. It's the statement. The entire Quran wraps back to that one statement. The whole thing wraps back to the opening verse of Al Fatiha, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. It all starts there and it ends there. Where does it end? You know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about ta'awuth. That's where Surah Al Nas ends. And if, if you talk about the first revelation, where does that start? That was, this is the, the beginning and end, Surah Fatiha and Surah Nas. This is the way, the tartib of the surah. Someone may argue that's not the way the Qur'an was revealed. So go by chronology. If you go by chronology, the Qur'an starts with Surah Alaq, Iqra bismi rabbika alladhi khalaq. Right back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And where does it end? In Surah Baqarah, وَاتَّقُوا يَوْمًا تُرْجَعُونَ فِيهِ إِلَى اللَّهِ ثُمَّ تُوَفَّى كُلُّ نَفْسٍ مَا كَسَبَتْ وَهُمْ لَا يُظْلَمُونَ That ultimately each and every one of you will stand in front of your Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the key to success lies in this one very simple verse of Surah Al-Bayyinah. إِنَّ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ أُولَئِكَ هُمْ خَيْرُ الْبَرِيَةِ Those who believe and do good deeds, because good deeds are a result of wholesome, pure belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Your belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala must be robust and solid. To, you know, at, for those of you that have children, for those of you that have young ones around you, raise your children with the paradigm of, of iman. When they're struggling, don't just tell them to be patient. Give them an injection of iman in that moment, a quick little moment of iman, that there were prophets of Allah that were tested. Have tawakkul. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always takes care of those that are patient. Give them that lesson of iman. Teach them a lesson of tawakkul. When they're struggling in life, because if you can teach them tawakkul, if the parents sitting here in this congregation can raise children who will live in, the, who will live in our shoes 10, 15 years from now and be in these communities and be the adults of our communities, and those people out there from this community, from our children, don't have a problem with understanding how to deal with difficulty because we train them in that in our homes for 10 years. We taught them the one important lesson of life, that no matter how difficult things get, you are to be tethered to Allah. Always have tawakkul. We talk to them, we talk to them about the stories of the prophets of Allah, and how they, were, how they were challenged, and how they dealt with that. And we teach them the practical application of iman. These children will conquer the world, and no storm out there can stop them. Nothing can stop them. The problem is, that we're raising Muslims that aren't trained how to utilize this powerful tool of Iman that they have in their toolbox. So we have a bunch of kids, 
and adults in our congregation that have this powerful chainsaw that they can tear any tree down with, but they're trying to break this tree by kicking it with their foot. They're trying to do it on their own. They're trying to punch a tree down. And there's no way to punch this tree down. What you need is your iman. But you have to know how to use it. You need to be trained how to use it. You need to be told about the wasabis and whispers of shaitan. And that is the responsibility of a parent in Murabi. That you teach your child how to live in a complicated world within the paradigm of iman. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala strengthen our iman. May He allow us to be strong in moments of difficulty. And may He allow our iman to grow in moments of ease. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow iman to be built into our life. Not just a statement that's tucked away somewhere. That our la ilaha illallah is a statement that is uttered and, and, and stated by our tongue throughout our day. That every time we face difficulty, before we think of any foul word to utter, or before we decide to call a friend to rant, that the first thing we do is we say, La ilaha illallah. We turn to Allah and we say, Allahumma iyaka na'bud wa iyaka nasta'in. That we turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we ask Him for help first. Because whoever has asked Allah for help, Allah has always helped them. The outcomes in this world are not controlled by you. That's in the hands of Allah. Your responsibility is to respond to whatever the outcome is as a believer would respond. And that is in a state of humbleness and a state of submission to Allah Azza wa Jal. Your ultimate reward, our ultimate reward, is in the hereafter. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept. Sallallahu wa ta'ala wa Muhammad. الحمد لله رب العالمين إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا محمد كلما ذكره الذاكرون وكلما غفل عن ذكره الغافلون ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار ربنا هب لنا من أزواجنا وذرياتنا قرة أعين وجعلنا للمتقين إماما يا رب العالمين اللهم اهدنا في من هديت وعافنا في من عافيت وتولنا في من توليت وبارك لنا فيما أعطيت وقنا واصرف عنا برحمتك شر ما قضيت فإنك تقضي ولا يقضى عليك إنه لا يذل من واليت ولا يعز من عاديت تبارك ربنا وتعاليت فلك الحمد على ما قضيت ولك الشكر على ما أنعمت به وأوليت نستغفرك ونتوب إليك وصلى الله على النبي الأمي سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون والسلام على المرسلين الحمد لله رب العالمين